Hello, everybody. Hey, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, we are late, but uh, the best comes last, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have a real room full of celebrities here, and uh, the topic of this panel is high availability for Mordic. Uh, the audience has just um, digested a very in-depth description of uh, what it can all look like. And I'm very much looking forward to all the questions and answers that we'll have on the same topic in this panel. So uh, I guess I'll give it to Peter to kick it off and to introduce everybody. Uh, and uh, I listen in and ask <laughs> stupid questions maybe. So I'll see you later, have fun guys. All right. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. Uh, Peter Vasilian. I am the CEO and partner over at Facet Interactive. So I've been hanging out in the background while all the people that are smarter than me get to talk about how awesome Modic is and how building high availability Modic is sometimes really hard. So uh, today we've got, uh, I believe we have Nick over at Drop Solid, and we've got Heath from the DMS group, as well as Jordan Ryan uh, from Facet Interactive. And I wanted to go around and uh, just give a little brief rundown on how involved you guys are with Modic. I know Jordan has touched on community contributions already in his last presentation, but um, yeah, let's dive in a little bit. Uh, Nick, how involved have you been with the Modic community and when did you get started? Hi, good evening. Um, so with Motic, I think it's it's just a bit longer than, than a year, um, but that's because um, I'm the CTO at Drop Solids and I've been involved in the open source community of Drupal for over 13 years. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, well, not very suddenly, um, we noticed that uh, Drupal obviously needs to augment itself a bit uh, into the marketing automation space, also the personalization space. Um, and then we uh, saw um, wonder over wonder that Acquia uh, bought Motic, um, the, the enterprise, or at least the, the company, and it made us wonder, okay, what, what's this all about? And it, it kind of uh, put us onto an exploration phase on, on, okay, we should really look into this technology a bit more. Um, and then discovered the community, um, understood also um, that very uh, smart people are in this uh, sphere, but also that the product is very young. Uh, and I think that's also what this panel is a bit about. This is not um, a very mature, mature proven software yet, mm -hmm. although it's very promising, uh, but it has challenges. And that's also why we are here together. Um, and in Drop Solids, I'm also the, the one like looking into these new innovations, trying to see how to connect with that community. Uh, contributed a bit into the Composer initiative with Motic um, and active on Slack in, in helping out as well. Um, so yep. that's a bit my story. Great. Thanks, Nick. And uh, Heath? Sure. So uh, I've been working for Digital Media Solutions for a few years now. And uh, back in 2017, we were ready to build another marketing automation system because we've built several over the years um, and uh, for handling different situations in performance marketing. Um, but we were prompted by one developer, hey, why, why don't you try Modic out? You guys have PHP developers. So uh, I took a serious look at it and I noticed that its uh, requirements, its feature set, you know, overlaps with the features that we wanted to implement for the next year. Uh, in, and so we took, gave it a serious, serious looking at and uh, did a performance analysis and looked at what it can do versus what we want to do and saw what we would have to build, what we'd have to augment. Uh, we, and uh, that's, that's how we kind of got started. Uh, we were in AWS at the time. And, and uh, so we said, okay, well, how would this scale? Can we use it for our level of volume? Because we're very high volume as a company. So uh, we wanted to see if we could be successful with that and if we could learn anything from it. And both have been very, very true. Uh, we've learned a lot about where the MarSec industry is going in terms of terminology and direction. Uh, and uh, we've uh, learned how this can scale, how this can be used. And uh, and we've learned how to take a community product and build on top of it and feed back into the community and actually make that effective. So tons of success from that. And no, that's uh, that's perfect. I think, you know, Jordan, if you want to give a brief rundown since you had the stage all of 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and you're muted, by the way. 
Thank you. Uh, for those who didn't listen in, uh, we at Facet have been working with Modic since about 2017. A lot of our early um, ventures into the Modic space were small businesses that wanted to just commoditize some of their costs, um, maybe had some unique models, publishers who wanted to keep track of contacts that um, they didn't really have a qualified cost per number of contact. Um, fast forward to today, and as Modic has gained traction, we have more of the enterprise um, customers, especially over the past year and a half since Acquia's ac acquisition of Modic, where we've seen um, some real traction from the enterprise who wants to take this more to a um, B2B sales nurturing type of tool set. Um, we've done historically some work on the order of a few hundred thousand contacts. We have some stuff that's in the millions that's in the queue now. Um, and that's where we've really had to investigate. As Heath said, you have to test and make sure, is this going to do what you need it to do? Is this going to get us where we need it to go? Um, so yeah. Awesome. So now to talk about, I guess, what we're all here to talk about, which is our respective approaches to making Modic highly available. And I know that we've been through our fair share of speed bumps along the way of uh, building out our Kubernetes implementation. Uh, and so I wanted to get Nick and Heath and uh, Jordan, you know, have you guys have a discussion about, you know, your approaches specifically, uh, actually Nick and Heath specifically to your approaches of making Modic highly available because, um, you know, we've obviously been doing this for about a year at this point, trying to figure it out. So we'd love to hear how you guys have uh, been moving along with that. Sure. Um, maybe like one thing I, I also wanted to um, understand or like make the audience understand, there's also more to high availability than just high performance or like a, a lots of contacts or lots of events. Eh? Um, in Drop Solid, I, at least uh, I have to disappoint you that we don't go into like uh, millions of contacts or that kind of part. Um, but um, the maintenance windows are important and high availability is more um, a feature set in terms of our SLA in making sure that we have like um, like the duplicated uh, or duplicated sorry uh, components in the infrastructure stack. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think that on its own is already also interesting for the audience to know uh, and different points of view that we're coming mm -hmm. from. Because I heard heat going into high traffic, uh, Jordan. I know that yeah. you're <laughs> really much into high traffic and context from the previous conversation. And, um, but yeah, yeah, and I think to that point. Um, for anybody in, involved, I think we've all uh, we've all spent a lot of time. It sounds like a lot of us have spent time with you know just let's say PHP applications in general, and making PHP behave across uh, you know a cluster or stack, uh, load balancing it, and making sure that you know you have the maintenance windows are absolutely negligible. Making sure that you know you have failover, you have all of those things um, as a strong foundation for. Uh, uh, scalability and just reliability for clients is definitely, you know, it's it's not the coolest thing when you won't be. It's the, you can't go like I've got ten million of this and we're gonna go toss that at the you right. know <laughs> the stack. But um, yeah, no, one hundred percent, Nick. And I don't know if you wanted to go a little bit more into yeah, how so you guys handle it. I um, I prepared a little document to just like show an infrastructure diagram because talking about uh, Google Cloud or Kubernetes isn't very easy if you cannot really like show some components. Yep. Uh, so I think that would be useful. Um, so let me share that. Um, and it's in the sense that it's more or less the same diagram that we use for Drupal applications. Um, we don't use the fancy uh, Kubernetes technology, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I heard a lot about that in the previous session. Um, we mainly go with native Google Cloud components um, to simplify a couple of things, um, which also means that we can use uh, services like the network load balancer in Google Clouds for one single IP address that then goes into uh, duplicated uh, SSL offloading uh, instances for making sure that traffic gets um, where it could be or where it can be. And from there on, it can either go to one or multiple web nodes um, which has the Nginx and FPM and everything that you discussed in the previous uh, session. Nick, are you uh, sharing? I'm not seeing it on screen. Oh, I should be, but maybe the screen is not being shared by the moderator. I don't know if I can. Uh, I'm also not the moderator, so I don't know if Eki's yeah. running around the back end. Let's make sure that it gets up on screen. 
before we keep going. Yeah, let me see if you can see it. Eh? Or let me know when, when you can see it. Otherwise, I do have to talk about it and you can't see it. That's also fine. Let's see. Can I share? <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, we didn't prepare this well enough to test if we can share a screen if we have four people in the room. Yeah, it's not up on the track. So I, I just want if uh, fine, maybe we come back to it when Eki can. Um... Yeah, I'll 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 flag this question and we'll come back to it once we. Yeah, well, uh, have I'll a talk about a bit about like the okay. components that we use. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously, uh, SSL is loading different instances that can help there. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we have these web nodes. Um, but then the interesting part is that we use in, in Google Clouds um, the Google Distributed File System. Um, which is basically an AVS on steroids um, because Matic and I think it was touched upon in the previous session as well, like it needs a writable file system and, and every PHP application has a lot of issues if you suddenly go into a read-only mode. Um, so we, we solve that problem by uh, ignoring it and making sure that everything is writable for every web node at all times um, with that Google uh, file, like a file share uh, or a distributed file system solution. Um, and then like the, the obvious solutions is uh, also ignoring don't do it yourself. Use Cloud SQL uh, or Google Cloud SQL that has replicas uh, natively. Um, and then also the memory store, which we use for Redis and Memcached, but that kind of touches upon some of the other questions that uh, is um, in the list of things to improve. Um, but that's for later. And then obviously yeah. I'll, I, as well is the whole queuing system. Um, but that's why I wanted to touch upon like what does high availability mean? Um, indeed, with high traffic, it's very useful to have the whole queuing system. Um, and I, I think there's obviously improvements there um, because if I remember correctly, there is RabbitMQ and Beanstalk D natively in the application. Um, but I do think Mautic should support a couple of other technologies out of the box to, to make it a bit more cloud friendly. Um, but yeah. That's for maybe and um, future questions. Just to talk, just to ask, just to ask an additional question on that, Nick. Um, are you guys deploying your infrastructure with, you know, blue green deployments across your as you test out new application features um, in this infrastructure, or um, kind of maintaining different feature sets in your highly available infrastructure? Um, well, because it's a single file system, you deploy it once on, on just one web node, and it's instantly everywhere. So um, got it you don't really have uh, the, the problem where you have a container per container that you up like do upspin. Uh, it's a, you can have, like, actually log in to every web node, change any file as you would do in, in the old ways of logging into SSH and editing stuff, um, and it would be instantly everywhere. Um, so it, it really helps in abstracting that problem away and just make it easy. Uh, consider it as a single server, but it's actually a high availability stack. Got it. And Heath, did you have any input on how you guys are handling uh, HA or what infrastructure you guys have that you're standing this up on? Sure, uh, I could talk about that. I, I have I created a screen chat. I don't know if you guys can share that in chat because I don't know if the screen share is working. But uh, basically, we since we're in an AWS house, we went with full AWS. We went with things we we're fairly comfortable with. Uh, and that includes Elastic Beanstalk, RDS for the database, Elastic Cache, uh, and EFS mounts, and just to get started. So uh, our infrastructure starts off with the Elastic Beanstalk cluster, which basically means we get EC2 instances that are automatically spun up. Uh, if one of them dies, it automatically gets replaced. Uh, they are ephemeral, but we can deploy in such a way that additional instances come online and it handles the load balancer swap over to the new instances. So that means during a deployment, our infrastructure actually gets faster because there's extra instances in the pool. Um, and since in, with Modic specifically, the, uh, the, probably the best way to scale it is, uh, is usually vertical, but in order to be high available, you need to be vertical and horizontal. So um, it's a little different than most applications where I would rather go much more horizontal. Uh, but because of the cron tasks and other sorts of things, it ends up being a bit more vertical than, than horizontal, but we still have to have both, right? Uh, so that's that's why we went with this platform. It makes it very easy to scale in either direction. 
Um, on the RDS side, that's probably the most important part because that's where all the bottlenecks are. We went with Aurora DB, which is a MySQL clone in AWS's uh, sort of flavoring. Um, and we found that to be a godsend, to be honest. It's uh, able to scale very easily. In the middle of the day, we can change the size of the instances. We can add more, no problems whatsoever. Uh, and we've done that so many times now, it's, it's a non-event. Um, it automatically handles the synchronization and then the swapping over. And um, basically, we give two endpoints to our Modic instance. One is the read, ins read uh, endpoint, and one is the write endpoint. And uh, that's, I think, a pretty critical distinction. You, uh, with most applications, you're going to have to set up some sort of proxy to do that. Uh, and outsourcing that all to AWS RDS solves the problem, makes it easy. Uh, that way, if we wanted to, like, switch to a larger instance, we can tell AWS to, to, per, to basically fail over from one instance to another and, and it just gets faster. Um, so that's been good. RDS, love uh, um, Aurora DB. I would highly recommend the 5.6 MySQL version for, for, for uh, Modic. Uh, anyway, so that's on the RDS side. After that, uh, Elastic Cache, we're using Redis to handle a little bit of caching and to handle sessions. Um, we're actually oddly still using a APCU for internal application level caching because there's not much in Modic, um, mm -hmm. and that's that's turned out to be a little bit faster. Uh, and of course, there's an EFS mount. So the reason for the EFS mount is because uh, you know there are static assets that you need to share across all your nodes. So when a new instance is added to the pool, there's this little mount, and then it sort of maps it and R syncs into a couple folders to make sure that we can share static assets across all the instances if we need to. There's not a lot of static assets, but there's little things that you wouldn't think about, like uh, you know the dashboard files, the JSON files, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so those are important that those are always available, even though they're not really highly available. We don't use Monik in, in the traditional sense for landing pages for campaigns. Um, you know, we're kind of a big company, so uh, we, we use Monik as more of a um, kind of a gateway in between different applications. Uh, so we sort of outsource our front end websites to other platforms and other things that we can scale, se you know, separately and independently. And we also outsource services like email and SMS to other platforms that either we manage, maintain or have purchased. And uh, so with that in mind, we don't have to worry about serving static assets, images and uploads. So. EFS mount is barely used, but it's there and, and it's available for things like old school file spooling, that sort of thing. Um, and let's see what else we got. We've got a couple other things that if you really want, we can get into the NAT gateway stuff. It's not something most people are going to need to worry about. Uh, but when we communicate externally through webhooks to third parties, which is a lot of what we do with Monic, uh, we need to often use the same IP that we used the last time. And so that allows us to control those out you know, those external uh, communications to, to basically be locked to specific static IPs. So that's the nut, you know, the, the infrastructure in a nutshell. <laughs> okay, awesome. I'm currently running in between, so you're going to see me as the diagram for now. But uh, <laughs> I like spun up OBS in the background, yay open source software. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Nick, if you want to share your screen, it looks like uh, Eki uh, has said that you should be able to get it up if you want to get your diagram up. Otherwise, send it to me and I'll replace myself. Yeah, I'm registering for Imager, so I'll send you the link in a bit. I um, I noticed, uh, Heath, that you know your master-slave configuration is kind of unique in the community. A lot of people go with uh, HA proxy and kind of load balance in a master-master um, cluster configuration. Did you... Did you have to work through that a few different ways before you finally landed on your um, Aurora uh, deployment that AWS kind of handled all that for you? Or what were some of the attempts you made? Well, in, in this case, we've uh, we've gone with different MySQL cluster options in the past. And so mm -hmm. we knew we knew that we could trust Aurora. We'd used it since the early beta days. And so mm -hmm. we very, I mean, we tried a couple of things, uh, but we quickly realized with the scale we're talking, uh, mm -hmm. You know, in the terabytes of data, we're definitely mm -hmm. going to not have to worry about scaling up the storage every week. So yeah. we decided to go with Aurora for that for those reasons. Um, and it. the other benefits have sort of just come over time because the automatic scaling wasn't even a feature back then. Uh, so it's just sort of been more and more icing on top of that situation. It's it's been a, a real help. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly. If if Aurora is at your it is an option for you, it, it's the easiest way to uh, um, avoid some of the heartache. Some of our challenges have been, you know, requirements by customers where they say we're going to go on enterprise or we're going to, uh, I'm sorry, on premise, or we're going to uh, deploy to our own data center, or um, we have to use this in cluster Kubernetes technology, which have all been things that have been said to me in the past year. And so I look at Aurora and I go, yeah, (laughs) I want that. Um, But it has been, um, it's been interesting to see the, um, the different routes, uh, maybe just uh, as a, I'll say my bit on our approach, even though I just said it in the last uh, conversation, but we have um, kind of productized the Kubernetes approach to make it highly available. And I would say up to a certain size of enterprise, it's been tested so far. Um, It certainly seems like there are these conversations and little issue queues or pull requests as to the best way to deploy Modic, but not necessarily a single um, a single defined approach that would work well for everyone. Does um, did did either of you get the feeling that there could be improvements to the way that we collaborate around um, these kinds of like HA decisions and and uh, architectures to make things more supportable? It's it's trickier yeah. um, because sometimes you get into an issue you uh, have to solve it because it's so urgent and you have mm-hmm. to get around it somehow and then suddenly you solved it and then maybe you move on <laughs> to something else and it's mm-hmm. a lot harder to to sit down and maybe um, it, it should be or it could be an initiative similar to some of the the things that are happening right now in the Mata community to uh, solve this in in a more peaceful and, and quiet uh, space, like, okay, what should we tackle first? Uh, for mm-hmm. example, uh, support for multiple databases uh, or different kind of databases could be um, just uh, an initiative to say, okay, let's take a look at um, how difficult would it be to run this on Mongo or on um, just yeah, native SQL and MariaDB, at least getting some testings in, some unit right. tests and all that kind of stuff is already like the first step, which doesn't exist. Huh? Um, mm-hmm. at this point. So um, it, it will probably go like a long way before we get into these practical issues and okay, how do we uh, support uh, better queuing systems, uh, better Redis? Um, because in, in that case also, like Redis isn't um, the best friend right now of Matica. Eh? Uh, I, I just did a quick Google because we didn't even think of connecting it before. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm wrong, uh, but I couldn't find much uh, so, like, also tutorials on how to make uh, Motic fly, even on single server stacks, um, with best practices, mm-hmm. would already help. Huh? There's a uh, there's an open issue for a Motic three cache bundle for Redis that has been in progress since before M- Motic three started. Um, first, it yeah. was done on Motic two. It hasn't made it into be merged, and now it's being refactored for Motic three. And that that was something I talked about in the last. Um, last discussion is that there are these kind of dangling performance improvements that uh, there are, I feel like there should be a qualified group of people who can kind of just say, this is what we need to move forward here. And it could already help if you have like certain test scenarios or automated test scenarios, or even uh, some collaboration with uh, tools like uh, BlazeMeter. Mm-hmm. Um, like I, I'm quite sure yep. they would also be open for open source uh, projects. Uh, to say, okay, this needs high performance. So what's the test scenario? Uh, what's, which is the test infrastructure? Um, and let's test every release or every commit or something along those lines. Uh, this is probably very progressive because Drupal also doesn't have this. Eh? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Drupal has the same problem. Eh? Uh, yeah. Keith, can we, I was like, can we get Ethan for, <laughs> for, yeah. for a second there? I saw him come off mute. <laughs> I think we were talking about uh, the release process, the updating process, and and I think you've got some significant challenges with Modic that are pretty unique to Modic. I've, 
you know, doing Drupal, it was different, a totally different ball game because Drupal is a very lean application with many, many plugins. And so the release process is always going to be a little different for everybody. But the core of the application is very much the same everywhere. Uh, whereas Monic, it's it's out of the box. It's a, it's a kitchen sink. And so it's got all these different features. It's really, you know, feature rich. So how a release is going to operate for one person is going to be totally different for another uh, because the data size and the amount and, and the way the application is being used. So uh, you, you know, may, you may notice the Monarchy B repo is, is quite stale right now. That's because we we slow down a release window a huge amount. Because when you've got you know terabytes and terabytes of data in there, you can't just push a release every day. You've got to be very very careful. You've got to look at every single migration that's involved, every possible table change, because a single migration, even just adding an index, can actually take 18 hours with our data size. Uh, and we can't afford that. So we've got to say, OK, well, what's a what's a workaround? What's another way to get that done? So the update process ends up being very manual. Um, I think one thing that the community could use uh, is is a better uh, way to sort of test bench releases with active data with more use uh, in, in it. So like the Travis builds have almost no demo data. It's enough to test the features, but not enough to test scalability or operational uh, problems that uh, users might run into. So it might be good to have a worst case scenario where it's got, you know, 8 million leads in there and it's got, you know, 50,000 emails and, and, and all these, you know, real world examples of, of difficult to upgrade situations. And then you could sort of automate the process of running through the update there and see if that hits any issues. Because uh, the first time I, I, I let a community release for Modoc, it was, that was the hardest part is, we think we've got it all nailed. We know what we're doing. We, we've tested it as much as we can. And immediately we find out, oh, there's these five other edge cases we've never seen, never never even heard of, but there they are. Um, another thing we could do is is rope in some of the uh, the features. I mean, we, we're talking about Redis and we're talking about adding you know, extra bits of technology. We need to make sure that when we do so that they are a supplement, that they're not required. Um, and and they are supplementing in such a way that it's not really changing any fundamental you know logic in the code. If it's basically identical code, so if it's kind of like Laravel and, and some other frameworks where it's you don't have to think about the engine, you just say, okay, today I decided I'm going to go with Memcache. If we keep time to that level of simplicity, we're less likely to get into these edge cases when someone like me says, you know what, I can't run this without a cache. I have to enable it, and that's not something that's normally enableable and so I go in there and sort of hack it and say, okay, I'm going to add Redis. I'm going to I'm going to change these lines of my config, and you know, and then there's edge cases that are only exposed to me. So um, if those were switches instead, so that they could be turned on, and if there was a test bench somewhere that had the the kitchen sink and and all of the features enabled, and you know, it I think we'd have better coverage on each of these releases, and it would you know reduce some of those pain points that a lot of people face when they're doing. Their high availability releases. Yeah. So with it, it sounds like we're hearing a lot of from all three of you guys, hearing a lot of you know the testing suite, just being able to account for uh, code change, being account for config change, and being able to test that as you know new releases are deployed. Um, are there other things that need to get improved in Modic Core? Heading into Modic three, or on the way to a you know truly stable Modic three, that um, are going to allow it to you know just be a more actionable, uh, be more mature platform from an you know enterprise and uh, reliability standpoint. Absolutely, I've got a huge wish list, but I can give you the the, the top <laughs> top few because here's the thing: now we're getting into the point where it's going to be backward breaking. Uh, and, and, you know, we're not, these are situations where we can't just do this in production. This is a complete shift. Yeah. Uh, one of the things well, is multiple queues. I think you guys have already mentioned that. And so I'm going to grab you for a hot second because you mentioned backward breaking. So not necessarily, it's going to be a breaking change going forward. Um, let's maybe talk about that first before we hop into the wish list. Uh, how do you, how do we foresee managing, like those breaking changes as an enterprise level, you know, before we even get to the wish list, like what, you know, what should we be preparing for going from two to three as, you know, HA is, seems to be built on two as a primary code base? I think that really comes down to having a process in place. It doesn't necessarily, in my opinion, have to be completely automated. Mm -hmm. If I know how to get from A to B, 
even if I have to do it manually and it takes me 15 hours to do it, I'm okay with that. From an enterprise level, that's very acceptable. Uh, it's, you know, so that we're talking about the kind of thing that's really only going to affect us with the hundreds of millions of leads. But, mm. uh, you know, and then those of us that, that can't go down for an hour, can't go down for 15 minutes, that's another side of high availability too. Um, so I don't really personally care if it requires me to do a bunch of manual steps. I just need to have that plan in mind. And even if it's like, okay, put in this, uh, you know, run this script, you know, that's okay. I'm a cool, I'm cool with yeah. that. Nick, do you feel, do you have feelings along the same line or do you have differing opinion? Well, on that? um, we try to like limit access to production instances or at least to production infrastructure. Um, and the Matic 2 to Matic 3 upgrade isn't the best example of something like that. Um, it, it was, well, uh, I, I don't know how to say this, friendly. Um, it's, it's not, <laughs> <laughs> uh, although I do respect how much effort went into backwards compatibility, I think I would rather um, have a, a migration of the database instead <clears throat> of the process that happened right now from Matic 2 to 3. Um, but maybe that's just my opinion, and I could be very different in opinions than other people. Obviously, that's why it's a panel. No? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But in terms of going from Motic 3, I think, into Motic 4, um, we, we should really think of like uh, even decoupling a couple of things more, including these Q plugins and those things. And then I, I do think we should consider being backwards breaking, as in don't consider 3.x to be like eternally valid. Um, mm -hmm. figure out a migration strategy of your mm -hmm. database um, and maybe that's fine um, and then maybe you are able to test this on QA and then have a deployment process somehow um, but how we went from two to three I think we should change that because in a high availability fashion that was really really painful um, yeah I think um, if I can add, add in here before I want to give Heath a chance to give the pie and you know the green field yep. blue exactly. sky options again. Yeah. Um, it has felt to me like these uh, modic kind of suffers from um, a lack of clear interfaces that can be tested. So one interface is load, another interface is the database. Um, we certainly have you know unit tests that cover this, but we don't have good um, load models for kind of stress testing this. Because I think that between versions of Modic, the model for the API shouldn't change that much. You know, API, the entity models is the entity model. Maybe the underlying infrastructure and application architecture changes, but it should still deliver a relatively similar um, solution, which is why I was saying that a load model test suite that is maybe open sourced that multiple people can contribute to that multiple people can use in their enterprise applications would be beneficial to everyone because if i'm load testing all of the apis and other people are load testing them we're all going to contribute towards better solutions um but i think that the uh, change management of of modic the conversation that's happening right now i think in the um in the Modic community around like a full rebuild of Modic to be a more 12 factor implementation. There are things like what I'm talking about with Modic load modeling that we should all consider in Modic 3 and Modic 4 before we get to that Modic 5 potential rebuild where yes, to Nick's point there, and Heath's point, there does need to be a clear, um, almost traceable data migration option that can be done slowly over time that still leaves the application available for for interaction but um you know making sure that the interfaces are all appropriately exercised let me put it this way the salesforce api integration is not going to change as we move from two to three to four to five uh, the load testing of our api shouldn't have to change um, our application interface changes reporting is going to have to change as the data, data model changes but ultimately the results of that report might not change too much. So how do we build tools to test reporting, to test the load model of the tracking pixel, the um, the various queues, and make sure that we have something that is uh, sets up Modic to be that critical business application um, as we grow. All right. So now, Modic wish list <laughs> <Yeah>. for core. <laughs> Sorry for the tangent, but. Uh, 
Okay. No, it's no, it's you're absolutely right. I think it would be great if we had some sort of universal test bench for that kind of thing. Something we could easily run through Blaze Meter mm -hmm. or something like that. I think that it would be tremendous. Um, but if we're talking about the bottlenecks, I think we all know, you know, the elephant in the room. What are the bottlenecks? They're, those are the uh, the cues, and I think that's already been mentioned today a few times. Mm -hmm. um, the campaign lead event log table. Mm. I can tell you mine is is bigger than it should be. Uh, you know, there's the max int incursion. There's a lot of tables that you'll hit max int on if you're not careful. Uh, mm -hmm. So so one way to sort of solve the queues is to separate it out. And I, and I don't want to like throw uh, the database based queue out of the out the window. It actually makes sense. You know, you've got massive delays. You've got a, you can. So let's keep that, uh, but separate it out have a different table for every campaign. And I know, uh, you know, I talked to, to David Hurley about this and he didn't like the idea at all, but I'm, I'm from Drupal seven days. I'm okay with having a few hundred tables. That's right. fine. It's not going to hurt me. I think we all uh, are. So, <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. So if we have a couple hundred tables, one for every campaign, that's actually great because then if something happens where we decide, you know what, we want to terminate this campaign, uh, it doesn't, it, that data doesn't have to stay in the database for literally ever. Um, it, we could literally drop the table and it's gone. Um, so that kind of se separation of concerns would be fantastic if it was at the campaign level and you know, at the email level, that sort of thing. So individual temp tables can be spooled up in stats way quicker. So that goes into the next thing. What about stats? Uh, I know we put in some PRs to change statistics handling in campaigns, but honestly, that was a Band-Aid. I would rather see there be a more universal way of pulling stats together so that uh, everything past the current hour comes from the stat table for every chart and everything in the current hour is is real time. So that means you still get real time ch uh, charts every time you refresh, you're getting real time data, but you don't have to sit there for 60 seconds while it figures out what happened the last month or two months or whatever. So yeah. having that automated, you know, stat roll up system in place, uh, it could be a cron task. And if the cron test doesn't exist or doesn't run, it just falls back to the old school way of doing things. That would be fantastic. And I know there are libraries to handle that sort of scenario. So stats would be the next thing. Another thing, embrace soft deletion. There's a lot of foreign key constraints and situations where something gets deleted and the whole system goes down. So you have to go and delete those foreign key constraints because you apparently you can't do that at scale. You can't, for example, delete an event from a campaign if that event is connected to 50 million leads. So <laughs> just don't do that. Um, pivot extended lead data. Uh, we had to bu build a plugin for that. Um, and going back to the Drupal 7 days where every field has its own table, I think that would actually be better here. Uh, I know that would make uh, segments a little difficult, uh, but that's just because of the way segments have been done. On that note, let's change the way segments are done. Uh, what if uh, segments are evaluated in real time every time a lead is changed? Because typically people don't have more than 100 segments. We do, but we're weird. So uh, just basically, if you had the segments basically in memory as as uh, something like a JSON schema or, or uh, a JSON query based system, so it can basically evaluate all that logic in the moment, then it would say, okay, you're in this segment, this segment, this segment, every time a lead is changed. We, in order to do that, we would have to decouple anything that's time-based from a segment. But that's okay, because we could have a segment and then describe time range it, as like a secondary parameter um, if we sort of locked that down to certain lead fields, right? Anyway, so that's just another idea. Um, it, we found if we evaluate that kind of stuff in real time, we can get it done almost instantly. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, add an optional secondary campaign cube for for processing. So right now everything is handled by cron tasks. What if there was one, one extra step, which is, okay, take all the jobs I'm about to do, all the campaign processing, all the email sending, and push that into a secondary campaign and into a secondary queue. Uh, it's kind of like how email is done. We need that for campaign processing though. So yeah. that would be That's, another um, question. I, I think Keith, you could probably keep writing to Santa Claus all, all day long, but I want to <laughs> add on to a few of the points that I heard that we we have been considering in a, um, you know, the entity stats table and I think the lead campaigns activity table. I mean, there is no short term value that is really contained by like keeping this in a database architecture. And with the advent of, you know, Amazon Athena and maybe some Parquet queries um, or uh, 
what is it, the new solution with uh, RDS where you can do uh, like a Fargate deployment to query remote flat file storage. I think that embracing some of these technologies where you can store some of this data as flat JSON files and then use these technologies to do the, um, let's just call it long tail analysis of some of these statistics and these queues are certainly going to be a lot better. I think we all know that you can't, grow and scale a modic application system unless it's going to be ready for a microservices architecture which is what all yeah. of these you know the point that i was trying to make with interfaces was before and maybe to to add on to that and, and maybe that's something that uh, and I, I hear that he also uh, comes from the drupal uh, spheres um is what, what drupal learned and what was really interesting is they have certain tables like depending on specific use cases that you can say oh, i'll use a different database technology just for this specific table. Um, I, I actually don't know great. if it's possible with Motic, <laughs> but I don't think it's possible with Motic. And indeed, I'm saying, okay, I'll write my own little database translation layer for this specific table into S3 or, or whatever technology that is specific to your use case, because there will never be like a generic solution that fits everybody, but you can make the software generic enough so that you can allow these kind of changes. Um, and another thing that I wanted to ask maybe into this panel, because I was like thinking about this, um, we have um, also a product that uses PopSup and Kafka and, and all those kind of things, which goes more into like streaming events. Um, if, if there's something that is very different from Matic versus like a website is that Matic cannot be cached in terms of like, events that actually go into the system. Uh, however, you can indeed put it into a queue. But then I always wondered like, why are we like, not using these streaming workers or like workers that are continuously just pulling RabbitMQ or similar queuing systems um, to process anything nearly instant. So you can get something similar to what he said uh, into like getting near instant uh, processing or at least real time processing without um, like doing bottlenecks into, oh, suddenly I have a spike. No, if you have a spike, it's fine. It will just pile up and it, it will process it as we go. You don't have like massive uh, instances necessary to be just ready for that spike. Um, so I, I do think that this is like a great like brainstorm that we should do with Motic and see if we can support these these native queue workers uh, that RabbitMQ actually was built for. Yeah. Um, RabbitMQ wasn't built for just having a queue and then making one PHP cron job process that stuff. Eh? Right. I think um, to to piggyback on that idea, if I had to. If I had to do like far future blue sky, I would say it would be great if Modic could orchestrate those microservices. If the code deployed separate microservices as opposed to us maintaining those microservices as a third party like queue worker. Um, because I think that if I said, oh, I want to have my Modic deployment and have my Modic deployment interact with that queue worker and deploy that queue worker, that's something that. Um, is kind of like code scaffolding that would require a certain level of, yeah. you know, technical orchestration and expertise in order to get that up and running. But um, I, you know, I envision that there are technologies, as you mentioned, database specific, in memory, you know, very very fast, highly scalable that we're just not capitalizing on because, as I said earlier, there isn't the appropriate approach for that interface. To be set up internally and hot swapped out. Uh, so I'm going to stop, jump in, and just mention that anybody that is sitting in on the presentation, please, please feel free to add questions uh, underneath the session eight questions tab, so that uh, I can grab those and ask them of the panel. Um, you know, we have about 15 minutes left, so would love to get some questions from the audience in. Uh, the URLs at the bottom of the stream. So I'm going to keep this going with. Maybe a little bit more of a, this is a pretty open-ended question. Um, do you guys have, all right, 10 minutes left. We have 10 minutes left. Uh, so as far as an HA Modic project for an enterprise, anybody that's looking to get started in HA Modic now as uh, from the client side, not necessarily from the agency side, um, do you guys have any advice for getting started now? Uh, do you have advice on timelines, you know, evaluating the tech stack, technical architecture, anything like that? I, I would say don't do it yet. See how far a single server gets you. 
Uh, and then see where the limit goes and then go from there. Um, obviously, if you went through that step, uh, fine. Uh, probably it's, you're ready for horizontal scaling because you maxed out your vertical scaling if the maintenance window is not the issue for you. Um, but please don't do premature optimizations. Uh, it, it sounds yeah. very fancy, but it's actually very cumbersome work <laughs> to do this stuff. Big, big box, much, much better than lots of boxes. <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds boring, but it, it is in, in some cases. Um, again, if the availability is not your issue, eh? if, if you just need to increase performance, see how far you can get, and then use cloud native systems like Indeed Aurora, um, I was just looking up in Google as well. There's also a Google Cloud Spanner. Apparently, it's very expensive, but it 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 promises limitless SQL, whatever that may mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, the dream um, limitless, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the dream limitless co comes with a with a price. Cloud, limitless yeah. credit card charges, yeah, yeah. infinitely yeah. scalable architecture, and that surprise AWS bill, yeah, or yeah web scale, bill. obviously. <laughs> Uh, but, Keith, but yeah, it's for those options, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's an excellent uh, observation. Uh, definitely start and assuming you're going to go vertical first, if any direction, and then decide to go horizontal for that greater availability if it's needed. If you can't afford to have one minute of downtime or an hour or whatever, um, then yeah, absolutely. Start with something that you know can scale vertically, no matter you know what it is, uh, and, and go in that direction first. Uh, you know, so that you can have all of your cron stuff running on the same instance. You don't have to worry about workers and spreading, and because um, and, that's where things get really complicated and very manual. It's it's not always the easiest thing to automate. So definitely, um, and on the database side, uh, you know, I would strongly advise MySQL five seven. Big difference, big gulp. You know, in between that and six, and or anything that's compatible with that and, and above, um, and uh, and be prepared for, you for there. That. Um, because I because I didn't explore that, but did you use like the MySQL uh, Percona, MySQL, and MariaDB just to see like what what happens? I didn't and because there's... I couldn't afford it. Uh, when you're talking <laughs> more than more than I, I don't even know how uh, how our snapshots are somewhere around 15 terabytes right now. So like I I don't have time to like spin that up in a Maria instance somewhere. Uh, I don't even know how I would go about doing that. <laughs> It'd be a challenge. Uh, so I, I didn't do an enormous amount of experiment, experimentation on that front. But I do know the difference between 5.6 and 5.7 is huge. There's also a lot of little tweaks you can make to your MySQL to remove those bottlenecks. Um, let's see. The, the, one of the most obvious ones is setting your isolation level to read uncommitted, which opens you up to dirty reads. But normally, I mean, normally in the e-commerce world, that's scary and terrible. But in the modic world, in, in this particular application, I noticed absolutely no downside to it. So. That kind of thing can help you a lot. Uh, setting your key length to, to a very small level so that uh, your indexes get used because that's the first problem you hit is once you hit a certain number of leads, suddenly Modic switches from the indexes that are the good ones to use to the wrong ones. And you're like, what just happened? All of a sudden our performance went from way up here to way down here. And, uh, and, and it's a simple solution. You just uh, you know force your MySQL to use the good index, and and you do that by setting the key length. Uh, so things like that. And um, I'm sharing a, a document, maybe in the in the private one uh, from mm -hmm. a FOSDEM talk I saw about uh, MySQL and TRX and bin lock and those options. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, it was eye opening to understand the consequences of of those options in a cloud environment. So if someone can share that link with the audience somehow, or at least with this panel. Um, happy to share knowledge um, yeah i'll get it to me we'll get it uh we'll work with Eki to get it um added to the the session and um at this point we have about you know three or four minutes left uh jordan did you want to chime in for this and then we can wrap it up or you're you've you're muted <laughs> I can only echo Nick's, you know, Nick's insight, you know, definitely scaling vertically as opposed to inflicting yourself with the pain of, um, you know, managing a cluster. I mean, there's, there's value in high availability, but if uh, you can manage to have some regular downtime and you know that your um, migrations of data will be maintainable within that downtime, then by all means, just go bigger. 
Um, and then after you go bigger, go bare metal. And then once that is kind of like done, then, you know, go ahead and move towards a solution that is going to be highly available. Um, but if you're, um, you know, trying to go with a cluster because you need to make this uh, across multiple data centers, multiple regions, disaster recovery, failover, you are going to be on one of these panels with us very soon, most likely, because this is not a easy problem set to work in. Um, that's, I think that's the only advice I can really give is, is try to get into the details and learn, learn where you're trying to drive this technology and the solution, um, because there are a lot of great insights in the community. And as I mentioned in my last talk, there's, they're, they're not really organized very well. So hopefully we can all contribute towards uh, fixing that with more of an HA resource at some point. Great. Well, uh, winding this one down, I want to say thank you to everybody on the panel, Nick, Heath, Jordan. And I want to say thank you to Eki, who's been running around in the background, handling all of our technical needs. Uh, and you know, big thank you to all of the uh, volunteers that have been helping out with this first uh, first ever Modicon. It's been a big lift for everybody, especially even, you know, we've been interacting with Ruth a lot. So thank you to everybody. We really appreciate your efforts and uh, I'll turn it back over to Eki. Yeah, and uh, I thank you all guys. And I'm really excited about this discussion because it, it shows us we're, that we're finally getting back to joining forces, joining interests in the Modic world. And um, the things that we introduced today was the Tiger team the, in the initiatives. Uh, frankly, I'm not even sure whether performance and HA, et cetera, should be an initiative, like a one, one off or a Tiger team or, or both maybe. Uh, but I sincerely hope that, that you and all the others out there that are experienced and, and, and caring um, in this area uh, get together and um, make make Mordic better in, in this specific niche. There's so many other niches where we can improve, but but um, this would be great to see this. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, we are approaching the hour. We will have our closing keynote in, in just eight minutes from now. Um, so I hope to see you all back there. If you haven't done it yet, uh, uh, use the time and go to our photo booth in the, in the fun stuff area under sessions and tracks or so. Uh, get your Mordecai picture. Um, and I see you soon, soon in the closing keynote. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Bye bye.